Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Debbie from NDIS Property Australia. I'm your host today, and you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things specialist disability accommodation in this ever-changing NDIS world. And today we've got two very special guest speakers, repeat speakers uh, from SDA Consulting. Welcome, Karina and Nicole. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us, Debbie. Hey, great to have you back. We were speaking a couple of months ago about what you do, your role as SDA providers and property managers in the SDA space. And we had so many questions after that first episode. We ourselves had a conversation actually after I stopped recording and I thought we need to do another episode here. There's a lot more to talk about when it comes to the property management side of an SDA provider's job, really. And I think what really came out of it for me was was understanding that the vast majority of the SDA providers out there are not experienced in the property management area, which is an, a really interesting point because there's no rules, regulations um, that you need to actually be a registered property manager to do SDA provision. But in effect, that exact is exactly what you're doing. And I know a lot of providers do actually outsource that job, which probably a lot of the property owners are not aware of initially. But this is what I would love to speak to you both about today, if you can, I guess, just go back over firstly your role as SDA providers and all of that entails. So as SDA providers, we enrol the property on behalf of the owners. We source participants on behalf of the owners. We claim the SDA payments and we manage the property end to end. Yep. Yeah. This is something I'm, I'm always telling people is an SDA provider is a p- property manager plus, plus, plus. Yes. So plus, yeah. <laughs> yes. So so obviously everyone knows what a property manager does. Um, that's the real estate side of things. Tell us about the process of actually enrolling the property. So once the build has been completed, the owner will be given certification documents, certificate of occupancy, title, etc., the as-built certificate and the summary. Once they have all of that in place, then they need to engage an SDA provider and we will then go onto the NDIS portal and we will upload all the documentation that's required on behalf of the owner and then the property will take, it can take up to 28 days for the enrolment to go through and then the property will then be enrolled in the name of SDA Consulting or whoever your SDA provider is. Right, okay. So now you said that once you've got all that documentation, then you engage at a provider. Now we would actually recommend engaging a provider much earlier in the process. Yes, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you would obviously engage a provider. You would sign your head lease once. Well, everyone's different. We, we get our um, owners signing head leases once the slab's been poured. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we've got others that do it as soon as they've got the certification for the provisional. So they know that they're going to build at a certain site. They've got plans that they have been advised that are going to, to be compliant. They're going to be certified. So as you say, Debbie, the sooner we do it, the easier it is the process to manage participants um, or to try to source participants. But what Nicole meant was that we can't enroll the property until we have all that documentation. So we can definitely do a lot of the work behind the scenes in trying to, um, you know, speak to seals and participants and try to establish uh, demand for that particular property before the property is enrolled, but we can't actually enroll it until all those documents are in place. Yeah. So tell us more about that process of sourcing participants. So we have a lot of connections with SILC providers, support coordinators. We have a database where over 
over the time we meet and communicate, they contact us looking for SCA properties. We have family members that contact us. Uh, there's a whole range of different ways that we find participants through all different places, people. So once we have a headlay signs and the sourcing participant fees paid, all our ducks are in a row, we will then advertise the property. We'll create a brochure, we'll put the property on Housing Hub, on our website, and then we will contact our database. And it's through our database that we get a lot of inquiry on our properties. In your experience, what sort of time frame are we looking at? That's a hard one to see. Really, yeah, you can't. Yeah, we get out. You can't answer that question yeah. because it's, the price. Every property is different. Yeah, and and the thing is, it's um, not always the participant that actually decides whether they would take the property or not. So before we get that application filled in, there will be our health team members that would view the property and, and deem it suitable or not. There would be the, the participants' guardians or advocates that would go through. The more government agencies that are involved, the longer the process it is because everyone needs to see it and approve it. So before we actually get an application filled in and a request for an SDA quote because they want to proceed. In some properties, it's fairly quickly. In others, it could take quite a few months. So it just depends. I think the more government agencies are involved, the the longer the process, and that's because they're they're busy as well. So whilst um, we try to get everyone to meet on site at the same time because it's easier everyone's on site to be able to give input and, and decide on what the property may or may not need, what the participant may or may not need. The reality is that we're not always able to get everyone on site at the same time. So the more separate meetings we have to have, the, the longer that, that process gets uh, pushed out, I guess. And even after they fill the application and we've done the SDA quote, it still has to be submitted for to NDIA for approval. And again, that process can take a bit longer than sometimes it should if, you know, whoever is in charge of it doesn't quite understand the process or is busy and hasn't gotten around to it. And Nicole can explain a, a lot more about that in particular because she'll be the one that's following up going, I'm still waiting on this or I'm still waiting on that. Okay, so you're talking about participants who may not yet have funding in place. No, no, they have funding, but you still have to have that approval process before that funding is, I guess, confirmed for that particular property. Ah, Okay. And some do have funding, but there might not be the right funding. Okay, so if somebody's got, if 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 we're talking about, for example, a a two tenant, so three bedroom, two plus OOA HPS house, but someone might have three tenant funding, they've um, they can't just automatically, if they're accepted by the owner, move in. There's That's they've right. still got to go Perfect. through an application for approval. Yeah. So even if they don't get a different level of funding. There's still an approval there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the funding could be for a villa versus a house. Yeah. And obviously that would have a big impact on their income, which we will then have to go back to the owner and make sure they're okay with that shortfall because they were expecting a particular amount. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it's it just gets more and more complicated every time I look into this aspect of it. And also with you just said then, so you said that if we've got a two participant house plus OOA, but you, we have an application that's got funding for a three participant house, instantly that's going to be less funding because it's for three participants, not two. And so their SIL funding will be for one one to three. Well, the SIL funding's got nothing to do, nothing yeah, to do with it. The SIL funding has got nothing to do with us because okay. we only can, we're only we only the SDA funding. Sure, yeah. So They're two separate streams. Yeah, so, so but in, I think with your question earlier, you were asking how long does it take? Are you Were you meaning how long does it take to find a participant to move into your house? Well, on, on average, you know, we hear all different stories. I think the... The NGIA state that it's sort of six to nine months on average. Other groups that we work with are, are very good at what they do and they might be able to fully tenant their properties within three to four months. So, yeah, I'll just, yeah, is do you, are you seeing an average across all of your tenants and properties? It depends on the area. Every area, the, the closer to a built-up area that the NGIA is, the process should take less time because we're not asking participants to move out from far away into this SDA. But properties that are, we we see quite a few homes that are in brand new estates, further away from built up areas, those homes are going to take longer to find participants for because we're asking them to leave the area where they have the family supports to move to that new house. And we're also asking the SIL provider to travel further to be able to provide the care. So those homes usually take longer. That's just the way it is because there's all those 
things you have to have in place. If you're building in a built-up area, the process should be faster. It's a pure supply and demand. There is a lot less SDAs and built-up areas. A lot of people are building in, obviously, the new estates because the land is cheaper, but then it means you need to wait longer till we source a right, participant. okay. All right, let's let's move on to the property management side of things. As as I mentioned, you guys are actually registered real estate agents and there are SDA providers out there operating that are not. So what's your take on that? I would say most are not. Um, yeah. And well, a couple of things with when you're licensed that agent, you use a statutory trust account. So we're audited externally. So the way we manage our accounts, how our funding is received, how we pass it on to our owners, there is a process where there is an audit. Whereas if you're not a licensed estate agent, then nobody really looks at your books. So when you hear owners saying, I'm not getting paid, I know there's someone in there, but I'm not getting paid. Well, they can't happen with us because we're getting audited and our accounts are reconciled on a daily basis. So that's one of the things too, but Nicole has got huge experience. So it's almost 20 years now experience on property management. So I'll let you explain that that side of it. I just actually that. worked it out. I'm like, how many years do I actually have? It's 18. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Close to 20. Yep. Yeah, it was 18 enough. years. Yeah, close. Yeah. Yep. No, because yeah. I was trying to work it out exactly to the, like, I had a quick look at my certificate when I completed my agent's rep. Yeah. So I've actually worked in real estate for 20 years, but I've actually, I've been a property manager for 18 so when it comes to property, yes, I've got lots of experience I would, and all I've done is residential property management. So with the SDA side of it, obviously there's a lot of plus, 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 plus that we're, we've had to learn. But um, in regards to FDA, the compliance side of things is still the same as a standard rental. We still use CAV, you know, have, we still have to- um, Consumer Affairs Victoria. As an FDA. Yep. Consumer Affairs Victoria, we use their leases. You know, you need to notify CAV. When you engage in an SDA lease for properties in Victoria, obviously every state would have uh, every state's a different. different. Yeah. So we're Australia wide, so obviously we have we know obviously every state's different. Every government body for that state's a little bit different. Some other states, you know, they want you to register the head lease with their titles off it. In Victoria, you don't have to. But there's so it's so complex and there's so many things involved. I don't think people realise just how many. And how many people are involved when it comes to the just to one SDA property? Okay. So, yeah, tell us more. Yeah. So, we've, we've sourced your participant. We've found you someone. The paperwork is, we've got our paperwork. We then send off our quote to the, to the care team. We then, in the meantime, in, behind the scenes, we're all working. We've got OTs, behavioral therapists, all different people attending the property to see what modifications possibly may need doing because every single person is very different. This is while the care team are, are trying to get the SDA paperwork sorted for the participant. Then we're getting quotes done for modifications. Then we're trying to work out who's going to pay for the modifications. Is it going to be the owner? Is it going to be the participant? Is it going to be the NDIS? Then if we have all the contracts done, then that's just this is just leading up to the participant moving in. We do the we also do a condition report on the property. I'm not sure if other providers are doing that, but that's something that we do on every single property, an in-depth condition report. Once you also, once the, before the participant moves in, you need to ensure that there's a service booking in place because if, well, that's how a service booking is what is done with the NDIS. You must have a service booking in place to be able to put a payment request through. So if there's no service booking, I can't put the payment request through. If I can't put the payment request through, the owner doesn't get the money. So that's some, and that can take some time because that's something I can't do. I'm powerless. I've got no control over the service booking. That has to be done by the support coordinator. I, sorry, I, I rephrase that. I can ask the NDIS to create a service booking, yes, but I've got no control over the service booking getting created because that's done by the NDIS. And that's what I said earlier, that you could have all the paperwork lined up, but then, you know, that final step as to how long it takes before the participants actually approve for that property can take ages if a person that is doing that final tick either doesn't know or has been busy or has missed something. And we're all just waiting for that final approval to be given. Right. Okay. So that approval is in effect the service booking. And the, 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 that final approval then allows us to, allows the service booking to be right. um, prepared. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So you've got the, the participants approved, the service booking is in, you've worked out what modifications, additional bits and pieces might be required. That's all arranged. 
And only then can the participant move into the property. Move in safely, yeah. And if I can just mention that, um, because what I always, or we get asked a lot by the owners, why is there mods? It's a brand new SDA that's been certified. Why does anything need to be done to it? So I, I would like to clear that up. And the reason is that if you can imagine that everybody with disability has to be put into four neat categories, everyone within that category is going to have different needs and requirements. So we need to make sure that SDA, the, the SDA has to follow a strict design standard to be able to get that certification. But then to allow that participant to move in and safely live in that home, that's where the mods come in. And we say to the majority of our owners, or to the owners, the majority of those mods will be something you need to pay for to allow the participant to move into your SDA and to live there safely and as independently as possible. And that's why you need to pay for it. You are getting that extra income from NDIA when you compare it to your standard rental because you need to be able to look after the needs of your participant. A lot of those mods would be considered like a capital improvement on their home. So we can't ask the participant who is already, for, for most of them as well, they'll be already contributing up to 25% of the disability support pension. It's not fair to then also expect them to put any more for their home to be safe for them to move into. So that I wanted to bring that up because we get asked a lot, why is it that we have to pay mods if the home is brand new and fully certified? And that's why. Yeah, absolutely. It's a absolutely. minimum requirement. Yeah. yeah, 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 totally. Now, a lot of we, so this is going off the track a bit, but it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. We talk a lot with our investors and buyers about future-proofing to automatically include a lot of, extras that go well above the minimum requirements. If someone was to look at doing that, from your opinion, what would be sort of common extra mods that would be required? Some of those things, actually, if you did do, you may not get your certification. So, and we don't know what the participant moving into the home will need. As I said, within each category, people have got different needs. So you can't, I guess, preempt what they're going to need. You could be spending money that you don't need to spend. There are sometimes some people live in that need, they need very little in the way of mods and then there's others they need a lot. So some, for example, of a robust dwelling, if quite often we would need fence extensions, but if you have fence extensions put in at the time of certification, you may not get the occupancy permit. So we need to be careful that you just get more certification and then we look at the mods because it is so dependent on what the participant wants. I guess when we talk about future proofing it, it's 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 a lot more to do with the the general construction of the building, like the spaces in it, the extra rooms in it, but also things like additional. If you're talking about a high physical support or fully accessible property, things like you know not just your height adjustable bench tops, but cupboard inclusions, wardrobe inclusions that are movable, and and all that sort of thing. Obviously, those things will not oh, impact absolutely. the certification. No, no, that's right. And that, that is great. And Nicole will agree that the, the more desirable that home looks, the easier it is for the participant to move into and the easier it would be to be able to lease it. 100%. And, and it does future-proof it, as you say. I mean, if you have the stock standard HPS, minimum amount of rooms, I see the, the minimum room size required, versus another one that's got to be more living space. The rooms are, are wider, so you could have a chair and a lamp. So you could have visitors, for example, so they can come in and, you know, not have to necessarily sit on your bed if you want to have like a, a private conversation. Absolutely, or, you know, yeah. more of a more than one living space once you start having more than two participants. Have an outdoor alfresco area. Have that kind of amenity. Absolutely, go yeah. for that. Anything that makes it more desirable. Who would want to move into that? Exactly. And that's, you know, it's what we say. especially in areas now we see where there has been a lot of construction that people are still looking to build in. We say, you know, look, yeah, be aware that, you know, we're, we're looking at getting to the point where we might be seeing an oversupply. But if you're still keen on that area, look, future proof it. Just build it much better than anything else that's out there. And, and yours will be the property of choice. Absolutely. The participant yeah. will pay the same whether they stay in your property next Absolutely, door. Absolutely. Which yeah. one would they choose? The stock they, standard or the one that's got a And it comes down to the fact that they have the choice. Absolutely. Choice yeah. and control. That's what yeah. this is all about. Exactly. Okay. So back to the participant. So we've got everything done. The participant has moved in. Participant number one. Tell us about the process of getting a second participant in the home. 
and the difficulties that that challenge involves. So with this finding a second participant, a lot of the time cell providers will have, they would have done personality profiling because they know the participants. Obviously, I don't get to know the participant because the level that the cell provider does. So they will have done personality profiling and sometimes, most of the time, they're able to match a participant with the one that's going to be living in the property. We will continue to advertise the property. We do get a lot of inquiries on participants who are looking for a property that don't have a cell provider. So then we obviously will refer re- refer them to the cell provider in the current home. We, If we have a participant that's looking at that house, another cell provider, that's fine. Then we can try and organize a collaboration between the, both of the cells. But there's a lot of profiling, I guess. In, there's, in, yeah, the there's just so many different yeah. things. You can't just put the yeah, second person that applies. No. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So from and where we will, we will, sorry, we will, like, so we will advertise looking for that. Pro- so for example, I have a property right now. It's a three bedroom, high school support property. We have one participant who's about to go into the property with their care team. And then we will then, and then I, I had an inquiry from a participant who has their own care team. So now I'm in the process of trying to make, put this together. Yeah, that with is the tech, with exactly the, what yeah. I was going to ask about. You've got, it's yeah. one thing to do the personality profiling and see if they're going to get on. But if it is someone who's coming in with a different care team, different SIL, how does that work? Lots of collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause um, obviously almost all of these properties do have an overnight. Yes. OOA and you can't really have two different companies sharing the one OOA room. So there's got to be some kind of a, as you said, collaboration of who's going to do what and 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 how that all works. So I guess from an investor's perspective, when they are looking at getting two or even three participants in a, in a three-tenant home, understanding how the care side of things works, is this really important because that's what makes it so complicated? Absolutely. Yeah. Don't, don't give us an away room that's tiny, just enough for a desk and, you know, a, a bed, because we may need multiple desks in there if we're going to have multiple providers in there. But it's all collaboration. So how, who's going to be using this space? How are you going to use it? The one that's going to need access to that the most is usually the ones that will sort of say, well, look, this is what I need to be able to do my job. And then in this situation, it's different. So it's hard to say, but yeah, definitely have some sort of a, a plan in place who uses what when, who looks after what and when. But, you know, we we all want to make this work. So I guess that's the the number one priority because we're all trying to make this work. We're all trying to make sure that everyone gets along. It usually does work. Yeah, cool. So what are the challenges are you facing at the moment? As you, I mean, you've been operating in the SDA management space now for how long? Uh, we got a registration in 21. So a couple of no. years. Yeah. Yep. So so what challenges are you finding really that are the, the most difficult to deal with? Our owners saying to us, why is it taking too long, so long to find a participant? Wow. When we get a phone call saying, all right, my home has been certified, when can we get someone to move in? And we're thinking, oh, my God, um, okay, where is your property first of all? Because that will decide just how much demand there is in that area. Mm-hmm. But we, we've got a situation where we might have, and, we, and we, this does happen, we have uh, a street where we've got more than one SDA. And, and you know, some owners will say, but you definitely show ours first because they're aware, a lot of the owners are aware than these other SDAs in the street and they know that they're both clients that were there with us. And they would say to us, but you make sure that my gets filled first because I came to you first. And what we say to them is, we'll definitely show your home first but we can't guarantee that your home is the one that the participant will end up going with because it could be something like um, next door's got dogs and the participant doesn't like dogs and the one across the street doesn't have any dogs, so that's just the participant better. Or, you know, they like the sun setting a particular time of the day, you know, a particular uh, part of the house, and the one across the road meets their needs better. So it's not a, it's a matter of they they come in first, so that's the property that they must move into. It's not our choice to tell the participant which one to move into. We show them, they choose, and the owners need to understand that that we can't force a participant to take a particular home over another. Of course. Again, choice and control. But it's, it's all about informing our owners, and Nicole will tell you as well how much time we spent. A big chunk of our role is actually educating the owners. 
So they come to us expecting a particular amount of money, a particular time frame uh, with when, with, within which a participant can move in, and they have all these preconceived ideas. And sometimes those ideas are very far from what is actually happening in the space. So it's our, we see our role as educators as well. So do you work, I know a lot of SDA providers now working closely with builders to firstly, not just to get the plans and, and everything right as to meet the requirements of the, of the various SILs and care teams operating that, that you're all connected with, but also bring what we call provider comfort letters for, for packages that investors might be. Are you involved in any of that? Do you do any of that? No, we, we do get asked for appraisals and we can yeah. do appraisals and we'll say this is the maximum that yeah. home is capable of achieving and we always put in there that subject to participants' plans and uh, supply and demand for the area. Mm-hmm. And what about do you get people calling you investors, potential investors, just calling you saying, hey, listen, I want to build in this area. Can you tell me, have you got participants ready to go? Yes. Very many. Yes. <laughs> Could I build in this area? You know, oh, the this great block of land. Come on. You should know. You're in yeah, that tell space. Me. You, you talk to people all the time. You, tell me. Just, just, I won't tell anyone. You just tell me, can mm-hmm. I build in this area? How fast? How, but how, how do you not know? How can you not tell me that? <laughs> that, that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, now, I, I don't know what to do. Should I go which category? Should, how, um, so tell me, like, what design should I do? And it's just, yeah, they really, they don't understand mm-hmm. it. It's actually so much more and complex than that. They're quite cross, don't they? Oh, now? so cross. Yeah. And even with us not like, – so that's why, like, we are very honest with our owners. They don't understand why we haven't sourced participants. Why? Like, don't know. It's been it's been three months. Why? Or four uh-huh. months? Why? Uh-huh. Because you know, there's a lot of properties in that particular area. Like, so there's there could be there's fifteen just in the, in your street. So we're doing everything that we can. But and I understand from an owner's perspective, they're paying a very high interest rate on these particular loans. Cost of living just for everyday families is hard enough, let alone people who are investing. But they do need, like I would say when I was in everyday rentals, if you know you can't, you need to have a buffer because if you can't afford to have a buffer, you can't afford to have an investment property because no one knows what's going to happen. We can't predict the future. And I don't know. And same with when I submit through that payment request. The NDIS pays them in arrears. So you, you a tenant could move in today, but you're not getting that SDA payment from for it. at least over a month. Yeah, at least that's over. at least. Yeah, there could be a hiccup when the service bookings created. When I go to put in, there could be a, and this happens to me quite often. I can the service bookings there, but as soon as I go to put the payment request, for some reason I can't link up the number. Yes, and the category. Oh, it's just a little IT thing, but that can delay the payment. Yeah. But, um, there's just, yeah, it's just, there's all, so many different factors as to why your home possibly could take a bit longer to lease, but we truly don't lie when we say, yeah, you that, yeah and we, we, yeah. we don't lie when we say we can't, we, we can't answer that because it all factors out of our control. And you got to do your due diligence. Don't just buy a chip block of land, build a home and expect it to be filled. We get some owners to say to us, but we know there's very low vacancy rate. People are all looking for homes to, to lease. And we're like, this is not a standard property where you're going to advertise it and you're going to get a whole heap of people with application forms already filled in, uh, a bond ready to go, and they're going to move in. This is an SDA. We need to match a participant that is going to be right for your home. It's got the right funding. That process takes time and it, it really is dependent on the area that you're building in. If you're building in an area that there are no participants, then it doesn't matter. You could sit there for a year, it could sit there for longer. So it's don't build it and hope that they will come. Do your research first. And in piggybacking off what Karina is saying, if I can, the west of Melbourne, there's a, a large amount of properties coming through the west of Melbourne. Massive and which is great. They're getting, don't get me wrong, where participants are moving and they're loving these pockets. But we also need to be quite mindful that sometimes they can take a little bit longer. Is there a train station close by? Is there a bus stop? And where's the closest shopping mall? What amenities? Yeah. What's, what's around it? Yeah. A library. Um, you, where's your closest Woolies and Coles? Can they get there via a bus or do they need to take an Uber or a taxi? So all these factors go into play um, like into play with their care team so when they first initially look at the property the first thing they do before they even call me is look and say here like this is where it's located look at a location yeah absolutely and that's just something that you know swimming pools 
Where's the closest public pool, the gymnasium? So many different things can come into play. Okay, changing the subject, just my, my last thing I wanted to touch on is apartments versus houses. We're sort of hearing a lot of of talk from providers recently that with with a lot of participants, even if they don't have the correct level of funding, preferring to or wanting to live on their own. And the fact that there is such a lack of land, and we're not just talking about Melbourne, we're talking about, you know, all the main cities. Uh, yeah. um, you know, there is a place we believe and we've been told that it's that that for apartment complexes, more apartments, good apartments, large apartments to be developed that you know, for people who might have a villa funding or house funding, but they might still be able to, however, they can arrange their care and support teams, be able to move into apartments. Are you seeing this as something that is, is maybe a good option? It depends on the area. If you're going to build an apartment in an area that is outside your metro area, I'm not sure that you're going to see a lot of... It really does depend on... Well, first of all, you can't have robust in an apartment. So with a HPS, for example, we look at, and fully acceptable as well, but HPS more so, can the seal provider, because the seal is not in the apartment, it will be a separate apartment, how does your provider know if you need help? If you have a participant that's, for example, non-local, how can they communicate when you're no longer in the apartment that they need you? And some of our seal providers are actually a bit concerned that they're not able to provide the level of care that they need for that particular participant if they're not able to see the participant. So you, you can have cameras, obviously, in the living areas, but you can't have them in the bathroom and bedrooms. So that is a, a concern to some of our cells. It really depends as well if you have, how do you evacuate? You've got a HP participant in a multi-storey uh, situation. How do you evacuate? Your other way is in a, possibly in a different level. Quite often it's in a different uh, apartment level. So ha- what's the procedure there? Does the OOA have to travel up? Is that allowed in an emergency situation? If the lift is not working, how does a participant get downstairs? Um, so there's, it, it's hard to have a blanket rule about whether it works or it doesn't. Again, we come back to what are the particular needs of the participant. Yeah. In an IL, it probably is not a problem. In an SA, it could probably work as well, but it really does depend on the individual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, yeah, we're seeing uh, some providers really start to embrace that concept of, of apartments, you know, especially if it's a, you know, 15 apartments in a much larger complex that are salt yep. and peppered through in really great areas that, you know, tick all of the location boxes and it just being an option for people that don't want to move out into the new estates because it yep. is so far. And and we know that apartments maybe early on a lot of them were were built too small, um, not designed well. But I think that yeah, as you say, I guess it's it's all down to the individual participant and whether it suits them or not. But but there probably are a lot of people who are getting funding for multi share houses, villas that can potentially reside in apartments. They can apply for any property. Of course, it's whether yeah. the owner is happy to take. That sure. lesser amount, yeah. Um, but again, how much care do they need? What uh, some of the participants have also said, especially if they're coming from say a group home environment, the you know that wanting to live by themselves, it's wonderful, and then they move in but and the up, reality. they feel lonely. Uh-huh. So if we have, because we're SDA certifiers as well, if we have any input in that type of development, we would say, do you have a common area? that you can make available and participants can meet, congregate and maybe have a coffee machine on the side or something like that. You have visitors. So you get out of your apartment uh, and you get to meet who else is in the building as well. So you're not feeling like you're stuck just in your rent and your carer comes to see you or your whatever, your seal provider. That it, For some participants, unfortunately, that may be the only contact to have during the day. So having a common area is a great amenity. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Okay, well, that wraps up all of my questions. Did you have any last thoughts, either of you, that you'd like to leave us with today? I guess this may be before you move into the ESDA space, do your research, do your due diligence, have an understanding of what it is that you're trying to get out of it, why you're getting into the space. If you're just getting into it purely for the numbers, I will strongly suggest that you really look at the demand data in the area you're looking at building in. And as Nicole said earlier, having a buffer because... 
there's no guarantees. The funding is tied to the participant, not to the owner's home. NDIA does not guarantee anything. So it's you look after your participants, whatever development you do, just have your participant in mind. Why are you building? How? What sort of amenity are you providing? I don't know, Nick, is there anything else you would like to add? No, it, perfect what you just said, and I, I, I completely agree. But that buffer really does take a little bit of pressure off each individual owner if they were to have that, because we do hear the same thing day in, day out regarding we can't afford the property, you need mm-hmm. to find participants tomorrow. And unfortunately, we can't just click our fingers and do that. Yep, yep. Totally agree as well with all of that. And that is certainly the you know really big part of our advice we give to potential buyers that it's, yeah, participant first and, and make sure you really can afford this. Yeah. yeah. And there, it is a very different animal. <laughs> investing in SDA to work, regular investment yeah, property. Yeah. Oh, it truly is. It's true. Like, even as a property manager, you know, yes, there's a lot of similarities, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just a whole different space. It really is. And it's an amazing space, absolutely amazing space, but it's a different space. And there's so many different people, so many people involved. It's very complex. Yeah. And I guess one last thing is when it works well, we've got a participant that's loving the home. The owner is happy you've got a participant and you truly do change the participant's life. Yes. Yes. And yeah. My, it's mind-blowing as to how many, the feedback that we're getting when we do our follow-up calls to ask, how's the participant going? It's phenomenal. Behaviours are decreasing. They're more engaging in society. Yeah. It's truly incredible to hear these stories. So, And that's what it's all about. Yeah. And yeah. it's worth So that's why it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think that wraps up our session today. So thank you so much to both Karina and Nicole for joining us. Appreciate your time and and your insights into the SDA provider side of things, the property management side of things. It's been, I think, really valuable for our listeners to get more of an understanding of how that side of things works. So we'll leave it there. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye, Dick. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and just share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.